Colin, before the break, we are discussing how Canada has a unique system and not necessarily for the better when we compare other healthcare systems in the world. Many of us will naturally go to the UK and say, oh, let's see what England has as their system, what the, the UK has with their NHS. Briefly, how, how do we compare to the NHS? Do they have the same model that we do? Uh, it's similar in that if you're in the UK and you have uh, maybe a problem with your heart or your, your knee, you can go to go and use the public system. Uh, it's not going to bankrupt you just like here. But you also have the choice of going to a, a private health care provider, if you'd like. Um, overall, the, the Commonwealth Fund did a major study just recently, and they ranked developed nations' healthcare systems. And they looked at things like cost, how well it covers people, services provided, and so forth. And so Canada came in 10th out of 11 countries. Just out of uh, 11? Who was, who was lower 11. than us? The United States came in 11th. And so, it, it, you know, it kind of makes it, I think it makes everyone come back to this point. Well, why would we be looking at the U.S. and copying them? Because this is always what people suggest. It's like, well, why don't we look at the countries that did much better? Right. Not Australia, New Zealand, the UK, uh, Norway. There's so many countries that are doing better. And like I say, they have that, that dual choice between a public system that everyone can use and then you can go to a private option. Australia actually does something interesting where they uh, everyone's covered. And one, as your income rises, if it gets too high, well, then you start to pay a tax if you don't have private health insurance. Okay. So that helps make sure that, you know, that the public aren't having to pay for millionaires to get healthcare coverage. They have the incentive to buy private uh, healthcare coverage. And at the same time, they give people a rebate so that you do pr purchase private health insurance. Oh, and so okay. there's sort of a, there's uh, sort of an incentive to buy it, and then there's the disincentive to stay on the public system if you're wealthy. So they have an interesting model. Their system ranks quite well compared to other nations. It's sort of similar to a school voucher system. You know, if you, you you're all accepted to the public school system, and and you know there are I think there are a couple provinces that do, that do employ something similar, but the the money follows the patient rather than just follows the system. Yeah, and it, you know, I like it that you're bringing in the, the school system because if you think about it in Canada, we have a public school system across the country. Every province you live in, you can send your kids to a local public school. And uh, in most cases, there's no charge. Sometimes there's small school fees, but they're not that big, comparatively speaking. But then most provinces also have some private schools where some people have developed private schools because they want to maybe focus in on a particular area of study or something. Right. And some parents decide to send their kids to those schools uh, but most people still use the public school system. And the sky has not fallen when you give parents a choice in education. The sky would not fall if, if we gave uh, patients a choice when it comes to health care. Okay, well, let's. we're talking about various provinces now. And, and uh, we, yeah, there is different outputs, if you will, on education across the province. They do vary. How did various provinces fare in, in your report, in terms of waiting, dying on, on wait lists, are some provinces doing a better job of managing wait lists than others? Should I look to relocating out of Ontario, maybe elsewhere, if we're not doing so well? Well, the short answer is I, I don't know. And the reason why is because the government's data is it's quite poor in many cases. Uh, some provinces, they just told us, we don't track this data. They don't track how many patients are dying while waiting for procedures, which... I think it's very problematic in its own right. Um, it is. I'm health... raising my eyebrows shocked as you said that because that is critical information and we should be tracking that. I, I think we should too. You would think a health minister would want to know if any patients are dying because the system is not providing them with care in a uh, fast enough time. Uh, I would think that would be very important to know, but that's not, not tracked. Um, some hospitals don't track it, some health regions don't track it. So it's very fragmented data that we were able to gather across the country. But what we can see from the data is that there are certainly problems. In Nova Scotia, they told us that there were 51 patients that died while waiting for procedures and surgeries, which could have potentially saved their lives. Oh my goodness. And of those, just over three quarters of them, of the cases, the patients had waited longer than the recommended wait period. So, you know, if you're waiting for heart surgery and they say we, sh we need to get this patient surgery in a month and the patient went, waits two months and dies, well, there's a pretty good chance that that's because the government took too long to get that patient the care they needed. And such a terrible choice to have to make if, uh, you know, you have such a small critical time limit. Do you wait till someone gets 
your, your, your family member gets that bad that you're now really critically in need of that surgery, it's almost too late. Anyways, we gotta cut to commercial, be right back.